Social Sciences and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Welcome to our discussion. This is a presentation, but this is really meant to be a discussion. So I know our speakers are looking forward to lots of questions from the audience. So joining us today are Freeman Dyson and Gregory Benford, and the presentation is going to be on the pursuing the next 35 years, where we will be in 2054. And this is following on George Orwell's groundbreaking novel, 1984, where Isaac Asimov looked forward another 35 years to 2019 to predict the future of nuclear war, computerization, and utilization of space. And here we are now in 2019, and it's our chance to look forward from here, another 35 years uh, to 2054. And we're honored to be here with these great minds who will share their insight and give us a glimpse of what the future could possibly look like 35 years from now. So to introduce the living luminaries, please welcome Brian Keating. He's a professor of physics, Associate Director of the Clark Center, um, and he's a um, uh, uh, faculty member at UC San Diego Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences. So, Professor Brian here. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's truly an honor for me to be here tonight to uh, welcome all of you, our guests, and our esteemed, uh, our esteemed speakers tonight. I'll just say a few words about each one of them, and then we'll get on to a couple of um, prepared remarks, and then uh, um, and then James will present the rebuttal to his brother, whatever his brother says. These these are twins up here, and being a parent of twins, I know how they get along. Uh, but first, I'll, I'll talk about the two uh, the two panelists tonight, and then we hope to get a lot of interaction from you folks. We are live streaming the uh, event as we speak now. There are questions coming in from all around the world. So first, I'll introduce Freeman Dyson, who is truly a legend. He is now retired. Um, which has cut back the productivity of the field of physics uh, dramatically, but he was most recently and most uh, for the longest duration professor of physics at the storied Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He's made many contributions, but of course the, one, of the, one of the most uh, notable is his contribution to quantum electrodynamics, uh, a field that uh, is actually behind most of the technology and greatest advances in physics uh, in the last, I would say, 70 years, probably the most successful theory of physics, and uh, that is judged by how quantitatively and precisely it's been tested. He's written numerous books about science and the general public, and when I was writing my own book, uh, which I, I won't mention because I want to promote other people's books tonight, uh, but I asked, uh, I, I asked Raymond to, if he would be so kind as to write me a blurb and endorsement. It's my first book, maybe it's my only book, now that I've got so many children running around the house. And he said, absolutely not. No, I have no time, and I, I prefer to spend my time uh, tackling the vast stacks of books that I've already promised endorsements to. Uh, but uh, I thought it was so uh, genteel, and so uh, I've actually memorized his uh, polite rejection, of, and I use it now, whenever I have to say no to something, I invoke the Dyson text. Uh, so again, more of his, but he's written so many books, um, there's some are on sale out front. And I'm um, honored that two years ago, three years ago almost now, he was here um, uh, discussing his, his most recent book. Tonight he'll be uh, available. You can ask him questions about his, his actual most recent book, which is a book of memoirs uh, based on his letters to various uh, people, luminaries. But the things that are more interesting to me are letters to his sister, his, his family, and just the intimate portrayal of the life of a scientist. Very, very um, wonderful book. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, a member of the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States, a fellow of the Royal Society of London, and in 2000 he was awarded the Templeton Prize uh, for Progress in Religion, <clears throat> and in 20, uh, 2012 he was awarded the Henri Poincaré Prize at the August meeting of the International Mathematic Mathematical Physics Congress, and just this year he won uh, a, a very prestigious Award. I'm blanking on the name for science fiction. Freeman, can you remind me what the award was this past uh, uh, this past May? Yes. Yes. Uh, it was an award for, for uh, outstanding science fiction writing. Uh, joining uh, the two of us will be none other than a Professor Gregory Benford, who is uh, who is an alum of UC San Diego. He was born on January 30th, 1941. January 30th, I said. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell to anybody that's sitting in state? He is a twin. The twins are 
not only not always evil. And today he has one of his uh, most closest collaborators, probably since birth, since before birth, actually his brother James, also born on January 30th. <laughs> even James's son's birthday, Dominic. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> Greg has been a professor at uh, UC Irvine since 1971. I've known him for about half that time. Uh, it feels like he's a, a true legend in our field, publishing hundreds of papers in the field, condensed matter, particle physics, plasmas, mathematical physics, uh, and several in biological conservation. He's been called a young Freeman Dyson. No, I just called him that. Uh, <laughs> novelist, a screenwriter, he's also written incredible books. Um, Easter, the Berlin Project, and his classic novel, which um, which uh, which is just a, a true a true classic, takes place in part at in the UCSD's physics department in the 1960s. So I cannot be blamed for that. That predates my life. Uh, but uh, it's just such a treat to have the two of them here tonight. I have a bunch of questions I'll ask, but I really want to get questions from the two from all of you uh, uh, for the two of them. So please let us welcome Gregory and Freeman Dunson. by someone who, for whom I, I have books older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a cosmologist, so I'm just the young guys. You know. <laughs> so uh, it's been famously said by such brilliant luminaries as uh, Yogi Berra and others that it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, and yeah, today's entitled 2054, 34 years in the future, um, uh, 35 years in the future. And the question of what the deep future is like, I think that's you know something on all of our minds, as I think maybe Woody Allen said, I, I'm very interested in the future, I plan on spending a lot of time there. <laughs> um, and for you guys, I think, I, I wonder, well, first of all, when you, when you think about the future, just an overall question, I asked you this when you did a podcast interview with me in the context of if someone is gonna tell you, I have good news and bad news, which do you wanna hear first? And you told me, uh, that your answer will determine whether or not you're an optimist or a pessimist. So first I want to ask both of you guys, are you net optimistic or pessimistic, not just about physics and, and kind of our day-to-day -day lives as, as, as academicians, but about the world in general? So Freeman, I'll start with you. Your microphone's over there. You may want to hold it. Just in case. I'm not optimistic about this technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a theoretical. <laughs> Good. So can you hear me? Yes. So well, I'm an optimist. And, uh, I, I, I look at the world today, and it's amazingly how much nicer it is today than it was when I was born in the 1930s. It was the 1930s, of course, was the blackest, the blackest time in the last hundred years. But everything was going bad. You had the Dust Bowl in in, in America. You had Hitler in Germany. We had terrible pollution in England where I was, and the, 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 every time you went to London and for a day, your shirt collar was black when you came home. The, 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 the air was full of soot. It, 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 it's the kind of thing, people have, have short memories, of course, but compared to the 1930s, almost everything has improved, and I see no reason why the improvement should not continue. Mm -hmm. I too am a <laughs> There is, I believe, no man, man as opposed to woman, in the world who is that old right now. Uh, men don't, well, we wear out, just basic, you know. <laughs> Chose us when, while we're here. Uh, I think everything is, is getting better, and the, the alleviation of the vast poverty of the 20th century is a work well in progress. Most of it's gone. Uh, if you travel widely, you'll see that in many, many countries. And of course, bad news always dies on the front page of the paper, which is why I always read, well, first, the cartoons, of course. <laughs> Second, just to improve the chances that I'll see a picture of, my, of one of my friends in the newspaper, I read the obituary. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. That was good. <laughs> Leads to optimism. So uh, recently, there's been a lot of talk uh, amongst the, you know, politicians and obviously pundits in the media about humanity's prospects in the deep future, maybe extending beyond 2054, but we recently heard you know, even dire predictions about the next 12 years for planet Earth. 
And some suggestions have been uh, popularized uh, both by, uh, by the two of you and, and by other scientists working here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and elsewhere about how one could geoengineer the planet to protect against possibilities of impacts of uh, global, global climate change and other, other things that may happen. Um, so I don't want to talk about climate change per se, but I do want to talk about this notion of, of, you know, of, of planet-wide engineering. First of all, does the planet need us to do that? Uh, you know, I get the sense the planet will go on just fine, maybe even if we're not here, but do we have an obligation? And if so, is there really hope? And who would do such a massive undertaking as to engineer and, and, and tweak the planet to perhaps protect it? extend its longevity, et cetera. So maybe, Freeman, you want to start with that? Yes, well, I'm against that. It is, uh, to my mind, what we need to do is land management and ocean management, but mostly on a local basis. But I mean, first, uh, I, we, we had a vivid experience this year of the wildfires in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happen to be up in, in uh, Oregon, and, uh, where we were enshrouded in sm smoke for about a month for, from all the fires burning, and it's been very bad. And, and, and we certainly have a responsibility and a possibility to improve things, but it has to be on a local basis. And we have to understand the nature of the problem before we can try to solve it. Clearly, it is due to human activities, we are to blame and we have to, to, to try to fix it, but it's not so, something you really need an international authority to deal with, especially the people concerned are the people who live there, and we better get, get busy and do it. So I, I would say that's the kind of problem I'm most interested in. I would not like to have some worldwide international authority trying to organize that kind of remediation the remediation is hard to do. It has to. We have to be prepared to make mistakes, to take risks, all, all the things that an international organization is not so good at. I agree, particularly because the major problems that we have are largely local, and in fact, it depends on your definition of locality. The Arctic, for example, is five percent of the surface area of the planet. But it's also heating at a rate faster than, than the average of the rest of the planet. Antarctica is also heating more rapidly for reasons we do understand from large weather patterns. So if we're going to do something in the near term, and I predict that we will on a scale of maybe a decade, uh, I advocate and did a lot of work for DARPA on the uh, screening out of sunlight in the Arctic in the summer alone for three or four months, which you can use aerosols at the very lowest part of the stratosphere, which is only about 40,000 feet, for, and they rain out in three to four months. Uh, the, the point is that if you lose the Arctic surface ice, as we are rapidly, then it's a positive feedback on the system. You get exposed more to the dark sea, you absorb more heat, and the system just keeps running away. Antarctica is in a somewhat similar situation, and the room of the Arctic contains most of Greenland, and so the loss of the Greenland glaciers, which would be a catastrophe, can be perhaps circumvented by such a policy. It's, it's short term every year. By the way, it only costs about 250 million a year, uh, which is a rounding error in anybody's budget. Uh, maybe not, maybe not Bill Gates. Uh, so I, I, I agree. We've got to do local experiments of a kind we haven't done before. But obviously, what we're doing is not. And it has become more and more obvious that carbon restriction is a good idea, but insufficient. It's necessary, but insufficient to solve the problem. And it ain't working all that bad. You look at the curves, they keep accelerating. Uh, and the, the only major nation that actually has cut into its fossil fuel emissions significantly is the United States. In part because of wonderful California. By the way, I don't think we should secede from the Union yet. Uh, I'm from Alabama. Uh, but it's because of the introduction of natural gas instead of coal. 
I think we're the only major exporter of natural gas, which is cutting into coal production elsewhere, too. So there are all kinds of things you can do like this that are small scale, but have big effects. <coughs> and do you think it's fundamentally a physics problem, an engineering problem, a political problem? We hear a lot, we had a recent you know, event uh, where a famous paper was retracted, or it had to be retracted from uh, you know, basic front cover of Nature magazine. No, it wasn't one of my results uh, <laughs> for a change. Uh, but it was, uh, but it, you know, it had uh, it, it, it garnered in some people in the public this notion of well, science doesn't know whether you know or not this phenomenon is real. Scientists haven't decided uh, and don't make good policy wonks. And so the question is, you know, a is it a soluble problem because we can't solve it. That that changes the calculation of, of how much you want to do for it. Uh, is it solvable using the laws of basic fundamental physical science uh, as we know it? Uh, is it practical to implement engineering, and is it politically palatable? Uh, those are all separate, I think, and, and maybe equal questions that need to be addressed. And so, which of those, you say you're both optimists, so I assume that you would say that all three of those can be tackled at some level, but Freeman, we'll start with you. Do you think it's a political problem? Is, it a, is there anything about the laws of physics that, that precludes well, it's all three, and, and it's, it's, that's the nature of the, the the human species that we, we've fiddled around with things on all different scales. And that's that's fine, that's why we're getting in. And sometimes fall back. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, nature designed us as risk takers. We are, that's, that's why we're different from other species, because we can take risks, and we do take risks, which is the only reason we evolved the way we have. So uh, 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 the one thing that I, I dislike about the title up there on the screen is it talks about predicting the future. And in fact, I don't pretend to predict the future. The future is totally uncertain. What we can do is to imagine the future so we have some notion of what kind of problems may turn up. What really happens, of course, is unpredictable. And the most important things are the things that are totally unforeseen. Ray Redbury once said to me that he didn't think we should try, we writers, to predict the future, but rather to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why there's so much negative and dystopian science fiction. Uh, first, as we all know, it's easier. You know, the problem solved by being not solved. Uh, I agree with Freeman again. This is getting monotonous. Uh, but, it's certainly true that we are the species, the only one on the planet, that moves forward by falling somewhat and then catching ourselves. No other animal uses such a risky locomotion. Those, you know, the safety's first animals are on four legs, and look where it got them. Uh, so we've got to take risks. The, the, the really hard part of this problem is how to reduce the risk while you're doing something useful. And uh, that's going to have to be determined. I think first by some real experiments that look at alternative ideas, such as say shrouding the Arctic or veiling, as the Europeans call it, the Arctic, to see if you can stop the retreat of the sea ice. You can use small perturbations to see what the result is. You couldn't possibly think you could manage this giant system without doing some kinds of experiments. You can't do it all the simulations. I would also point out that uh, having brought up uh, in a religious family, Episcopalian, that uh, in Genesis, the Lord gives uh, Adam and Eve the job of tending the garden. And the first injunction is to name the beast, which is a form of biology. So, hey, uh, we've got the contract. <laughs> talking about job security. It's <laughs> better than tender. Uh, so, talking about science, so in, in your latest book, uh, Memoirs and letter, Through Letters, uh, Freeman, you talk about the, you know, the great scientists that you've had a chance to interact with, and one of the most touching you know, kind of passages, but only in retrospect, you know, we're talking about optimism and pessimism, and it said, you know, the optimist builds the airplane, and the pessimist builds the parachute, you know, and you're, you're talking about meeting Stephen Hawking for the first time, and being, you know, horribly depressed, 
because you know he's gonna die very soon. This is 1970, <laughs> 71. Of course, he went on to live until just March of the last year, you know, 50 more years. Um, and you say the only time that you really felt, you know, bu buoyed is when you're in his presence, and you can only be thinking about physics and energized by the passion of this delightful soul, as you talked about. Um, so we have this notion of scientists, and I wonder if you guys could, you know, sort of talk about, you know, mentorship and, and sort of the role of, of heroes and mentors and the way that we think about this, um, you know, in science. Science is sort of an oral tradition that's passed on through the generations. And, you know, we have, we have students, and those students have students, et cetera. And I wonder, you know, throughout the years, how, how has, um, how, how's your philosophy of mentorship been shaped by the people that you have the benefit of learning from? And then, um, and then secondly, for both of you being so creative, how, in your opinion, is it possible to teach somebody to express the kind of creativity and so forth that you have in your career and imagination, as is the title of this center? So first, you know, the, what, what were the biggest people or events that shaped your philosophy of being a scientist? And then how, how have you sort of inculcated that going forward to train people, uh, to train the future generation of scientists? Yeah, well, of course, I was very lucky to know Stephen Hawking. He was just an amazing human being. And, and he was also really an important thinker. He, he, he really understood black holes before anybody else. He had done major, he made major contributions to science. And I remember I invited him to Princeton, and you know, it happened to be in the middle of winter. And I was very apprehensive. What is this poor guy going to do with his wheelchair? The streets are covered in snow, and, and how, can he, how can he get around? But of course, Stephen arrived, and the day before, in Princeton, the, the temperature suddenly changed from minus to whatever it was, to plus 50, and, and <laughs> the snow rapidly melted, and he arrived with his wheelchair, and, and was just happily run, running around the streets, and, and he, had, he, had, he had no problems. And then, of course, in those days, buildings were not user friendly for people who were handicapped. But he, he so we lifted him up and down the stairs, and it, he was always making jokes and, and, and keeping us happy. And uh, another time when I met him in Tokyo, he was staying in the same hotel, and he decided in the morning he'd like to go for a walk, and, and uh, would I mind to come with him? And I said, oh, that would be delightful. And so we walked through the streets of Tokyo with Stephen in his wheelchair, and silently, crowds of Japanese walked along behind us, and silently touching his wheelchair, he was an object of worship. He was a, a great spirit which the Japanese somehow instinctively recognized. And, and of course, Steve was enjoying that enormously, <laughs> making jokes and, and generally living it up. He, he had also a gift for, for playing to the crowd, which is part of his character, which I, 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 everybody enjoyed. Which is something, of course, Dick Feynman also had, who was a, another mentor of mine. Dick Feynman was a totally different kind of a character, but he had the same gift of interacting with ordinary people. And he was just obviously somebody you wanted to know and were, were proud to belong to the same species. Mm -hmm. Yes, great species, all told. Uh, uh, I met Stephen Hawking in 76, five years after you. Uh, I was a visiting fellow at Cambridge, and uh, Martin Mies invited us to uh, King's College for dinner, and so my wife and I went, and the professor direct, directed us to this room. I didn't know that Charlie Diamond was there at the time. Uh, and so door opens, you walk in, there's Martin Mies all right, but there's also Stephen Hawking and his wife, and Dirac and his wife. It was an interesting 
evening, uh, I remember thinking to myself, uh, something my father told me once, he said, you know, never pass by a chance to shut up. <laughs> and you do learn more with your mouth closed. I, I discovered that on stuff. So, uh, Stephen was always a blissful light for me, uh, indeed. Uh, I can say that some of the people who most influenced me were here at UCSD. Uh, because my brother and I came here from the University of Oklahoma and had good physicists, but we didn't have the likes of Maria Gepper Mayer, who taught me nuclear physics. And, and I did some calculations uh, under her. And, uh, and Norman Rostock, who I did my thesis with, who's uh, generated the firm of Tri Alpha Energy now, which is making great strides toward fusion. I learned a lot from him, uh, straight from, from writing my thesis along with it. And then I got to come to UC Irvine, where we started the big plasma probe. Uh, so people like that, Ever Teller, I was, a, I was a postdoc for him at Livermore. I, I, he was incredibly quick. I could calculate seemingly anything. Uh, and uh, also had a strange warped sense of humor. Uh, he asked me to go swimming once, and I knew that he was missing his left calf had been run over by a street car when he was a teenager. And uh, so I showed up at the pool, and there he was in a three-piece suit. Whereupon he sat down in a chair, or well, he stood up and then sat down and, and took off the entire suit to reveal he was wearing swimming trunks, then took off his left calf and threw himself with one leg into the pool. I, 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 you know, it's kind of hard to describe what the reaction is. <laughs> but he did need help getting out of the pool. Uh, so I, I, one of the things I like about science is that it's got these great eccentrics in it. And uh, also some not great eccentrics. But, but, but uh, so, uh, I had an editor once said, say, you know, one of the things that people like in your novels is that you put, portray the personalities of sciences. And he said, most people think that they don't have any. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So speaking of the stereotype of, you know, kind of disembodied uh, scientists, there's been a lot of talk about the impact of artificial intelligence and what that may do in the future, both for good and potential harm to economies, to industries, et cetera. Uh, some are even applying uh, tools of artificial intelligence to put uh, you know, certain, certain entities out of business known as physicists, and that we, some of the uh, work that we do can be outsourced, if you will, to artificial intelligences. And the question that I have is, um, are you worried about that? Are, are these things that concern and should concern society? I mean, they already are sort of being um, uh, warned about by the likes of Stephen Hawking and, and, and Elon Musk as you know, one of the great potential danger signs for all humanity's existence. So I'm wondering what you guys think about the prospects for artificial intelligence, uh, both uh, good and perhaps for harm. Well, this is a, what's been going on for 70 years. We have huge numbers of people have been thrown out of their jobs. All the empty factories all over the country. This is a big problem, and it has been a big problem for a long time. It's not new, but of course it could get worse. And perhaps we, we really should be worrying about it much more than we are. It's a, it, 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 it's a disgrace that we're not taking care of all these people who are losing jobs to machines. And that's... A, it's a world we live in and which we will continue to live in, but it's not something big in the future. This is something real that's going on now. True enough. Uh, you know, if you really wanted to get human level in artificial intelligence, you also have to invent artificial stupidity. Yes. <laughs> because uh, that's, a, in a way, it's a gift. It's called risk taking. Uh, look how many people died. <coughs> fly on essentially hand gliding without the right aerodynamics. Done right here. Uh, I had a conversation long ago with a, a good friend of mine, Mark Minsky, who's a very big on AI at, at MIT. And I asked him once, uh, if you get human level AI, will it have an unconscious? Because we do, and it's a very powerful source of ideas, or at least it is in my life, and I think it is in most people. The unconscious part of the mind is most things over, and suddenly 
produces things. I always say, you know, we don't actually have ideas. Ideas have us. They arrive out of nowhere. You haven't figured them out consciously. And Martin said, you know, he never even thought of that, of that problem. Uh, and I said, uh, the fact that our minds conceal from us a great deal of our creativity is a huge clue. And we don't understand it. And we certainly don't know how to program it. So I'm not optimistic that we're really going to get human intelligence and stupidity married into one entity that can do productive things for us right away. I, routine tasks, yes. But the hard stuff is really hard. And uh, I, I don't think, let's put it this way. Theoretical physicists, I think, use computers a lot, but I don't think we're going to get put out of our jobs because of it. So, yeah, I'm bringing that up and circling back <clears throat> to a comment I made earlier about this question of whether or not you can teach creativity. Can you teach it to a student, to a, to a meat computer, <laughs> you know, let alone teach it to an artificial intelligence? Um, so along those lines, I'm fascinated by both of you guys are so productive and, uh, you know, such voluminous output. Uh, how, what is your creative process like? As, as, I mean, you guys are basically artists in a sense. I mean, your father was an artist. And, uh, but how do you, uh, what, what is your process? How did you guys come to be as prolific as you are while also having day jobs as, as professional scientists? Well, I've been very lucky. I've always been paid for doing whatever I please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the end. So, I can't speak for the... Uh, yeah, the average scientist, I, 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 essentially what, what I do is write either on a computer or on a, with a pen. And I always feel that, the, as, as you were saying, that it's the fingers that do the thinking, it's not, not the head. So somehow or other I have to have the head in my hand and then it writes and I see something interesting. And that I go on that, that, that some, it is an unconscious process and that's one something we don't understand and still it works. Yeah, I, I also said to Minsky after we tossed this idea around a little bit, I said, uh, we don't even know why we can't see the unconscious, except if it's, a, if it's a very clear example of maybe you were not meant to try to take, lift the hood and work on this part of the brain. Consciously, uh, I, I agree. If, if I've been lucky enough uh, to be able to get into a profession where you can do what you want and write what you want. Uh, I I have a series of tricks I've used ever since I was a boy. Uh, uh, in the evening, I don't just fall asleep. But before, when I'm getting drowsy, I review in my mind or even read things about what I'm working on. That maybe it's a problem a novel or a scene, or maybe it's a mathematical calculation and things like that. And then I go to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning, I don't open my eyes. I lie there and I review all the problems. And my experience is that about a third of the time, there's an idea here. Free. Why are you going to sleep in? <laughs> now, sometimes it doesn't work, but it, you get it for free. And I think I mean, you can consciously let the unconscious talk to you. And my own experience is if you don't do that, uh, it stops sending you notes. <laughs> you know, it needs an outlet. It's just like anything else in the living system. Do you sleep with a journal next to you or a toilet paper recorder, lunch recorder? Uh, yeah, I did that for a while. And, and often I couldn't read what I <laughs> I didn't turn on the light. And, uh, the other, the, but one time I could read it and it said, Write down your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so, sign dad. <laughs> Didn't want you to say them out loud. And then Freeman, for you, you mentioned in your book you were stunned. Maybe uh, was it Teresa um, that you? So just getting back to the craft that you employ as a writer for this most recent book, you had the material sitting, in, you know, I think in your mother's house or in your sister's house. Uh, all these letters accrued from 1941. Uh, including one on the day of uh, their birth, the Denver boy's birth. Um, and so you compiled this. So I'm just summarizing this for the audience, perhaps, as another piece of advice to go along with the kind of um, uh, the mental hacks that, that Greg just presented. Keep your letters, because you don't know when they're going to be, uh, you know, you may need them someday to write a book if you're 
of your selling clients. I thought that was a wonderful piece of advice in your in your most recent book. Okay. Yes, actually, I got the reason this happened to me was I I read the double helix. Mm -hmm. The story of this Rick Watson discovery of a, 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 a structure of DNA written by, uh, by, by uh, Jim Watson himself. And uh, I mean, with, this book is full of human details which are wonderfully described. Of his, uh, all the people involved, it's a very personal story. The small bunch of characters who did the work. That he actually reports from uh, verbatim conversations and events as they happen from day to day, describing how this all works out. And so I happened to meet Jim Watson after I read the book, and I said to him, oh, well, it was such a delightful book to read. How did you remember all these details? And he said, oh, that was easy. I always wrote letters to my brother every week, because at that time he was in England, his mother was in America. And so he wrote her these weekly descriptions of what happened. And so she kept the letters. So after hearing that, the very next day, I wrote to my mother. <laughs> I was in America, and she was in England. And I told her, don't throw away the letters. <laughs> I really owe that to Jim Watson. That's true. I mean, uh, one of my agents would say to me, uh, uh, keep your correspondence. Um, think about your biography. Yeah, right. Uh, keep your correspondence. Uh, some fans would would maybe like to, to buy it, and you may need it sometime to make bail. Right. Our <laughs> <laughs> alibi. That's right. So I'm going to stop, you know, writing down all my correspondence using Snapchat. Uh, <laughs> great. Um, speaking of intelligences, uh, I want to move in a slightly different direction. Um, I want to talk about two things, and then I want to start opening it up pretty soon for, for questions from the audience but to provoke the, the topic. Um, there's a couple of different conversations that are going on. You mentioned that you've been hearing about artificial intelligence for 70 years, and it certainly seems like things are speeding up towards the so-called alleged singularity. I remember programming on a very simple, you know, 8-bit uh, computer, the, the, the kind of question-and-answer game known as ELIZA which was meant to be a very, very poor kid's uh, version of a Turing machine um, back in the 70s, 80s. <clears throat> and at that time, you know, it wasn't clear at all that you'd have things like, that are so helpful as the Microsoft paperclip. I mean, I couldn't even have dreamed about it. So, but Siri, Amazon Alexa, and all sorts of other artificial intelligence that are built in, and that even my toddlers will engage with on a, on a daily basis. Seems like something is accelerating. You know, Greg Kurzweil calls it the singularity when this technological advance will be uh, basically driven by these positive feedback mechanisms that Greg spoke about um, in a different context. But do you, is this something that is, is just continued to be hyped up? And then an allied question will be something uh, called the simulation hypothesis, popularized by several physicists lately that I, that I would like to talk about with, with each of you. But first, on the question of really the singularity, is that, is that something that you take seriously? Or is no, I don't. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that doesn't look reasonable to me that I should be wrong. I mean, things happen, and we, we, we must expect to be surprised. And so there might be a singularity. I, 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 I would be, if I was still around, I think I, I would be very surprised. But uh, what's clear is that the details Things we just have to learn to live with. It's not, it's not a curable problem. It's a, it's, it's a, we, we, what, what we're concerned with is two types of intelligence, the human brain and the electronic machines. <laughs> and they are basically different because the human brain on the, on the whole operates as an analog computer. Analog means it deals with continuous quantities we are mostly, uh, mostly, our brains are mostly concerned with recognizing faces, recognizing sp speech, recognizing patterns of all sorts, comparing them with a huge library of 
experience in the memory. And somehow this is done with extraordinary speed, uh, which we don't understand. And it's done, uh, as far as we can tell, it has nothing much to do with digital computation. Uh, uh, the electronic machines, of course, are totally different in design. They, they are enormously more precise. They have this incredible reliability and incredible accuracy. So they can do all kinds of things that we can't do. But on the other, on the other hand, they are not good at precisely pattern recognition and hand, handling images and ha handling pa patterns spread over a whole area, looking at a whole scene. I mean, for example, our perception of music is something qualitative rather than quantitative. We, we feel music, and it's very much part of our nature, but we can't calculate it, and so much the better. We have uh, it's one of our gifts, which uh, probably the machines will have to uh, 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 admit defeat. But anyhow, so we have these two kinds of intelligence which have to learn to live together, and uh, we don't know what the problems really are going to be. So I think, I mean, so this, uh, the singularity is one possibility. I think it's much more likely we will have ups and, ups and downs continuing uh, unpredictably uh, as far as we can see. I, I, I agree with that general picture. Uh, I recently listened to a piece of software I think it's probably on the web somewhere, uh, which had been programmed to write like Johann Sebastian Bach. And I listened to some short pieces, and they did sound Bach-like. But it wasn't writing the Brandenburgs, or the French Suites, or the Mrs. Limbus. Uh, it was putting out bits and pieces. So I expect there will be a surge in capabilities, but you will be continually surprised. God, I didn't think they could do that or this. But it's, general intelligence is going to be much harder. I think it's going to be, in, in our lifetimes, an experience like having a really good, diligent, but largely inexperienced graduate student. If <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't know what a new technology will do, uh, and that's one of its advantages. I mean, historians know that, for example, alcohol was invented so that ugly people could have children. <laughs> but it's a much wider influence. <laughs> Nature, yeah, on the subject of, you know, kind of partnerships with, you know, humans and, and so forth. Uh, I saw a statistic, you know, Google was bragging that this algorithm has a 91%, you know, success rate in identifying pictures of cats. And I was like, that's great. My three-year-old is 100% rate of recognizing pictures of cats. <laughs> And then, uh, then she proceeded to do something which, you know, it was really the first time I, I felt empathy, you know, for something that was inanimate. So we have a Roomba and going around the room sometimes cleaning up, and, and then she kicked it. I felt pain from the behalf of this little robotic Roomba, you know, has very simple artificial intelligence. I wonder what will happen in the future when we have true assistance in physical space and how people will react to that. You, you think the Roomba will turn on her? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I already worry enough as it is about vacuum energy. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, what, I'd like, <laughs> what I'd like to do now is to open the floor to questions. Uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, have people sort of uh, ask their questions and then I'll repeat it so everybody can hear in the audience and so for the benefit of the panelists up here. And I'd like a very broad swap of the audience uh, from all different backgrounds, et cetera. Sometimes we get a few of my uh, close friends and plants that are the only ones asking questions. So I, I'd really love to get a, a, a broad spectrum of questions. If some of your close friends are plants? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we will start it off. I didn't mean to scare off anybody, and I, have, uh, I can ask questions for the rest of the hour, too. Uh, I'll start over here. You have the first question. You right there with your black shirt. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm curious, going off of the idea of artificial intelligence, and recognizing that it's entirely possible that in the next 35 years, the, the constant prediction being, in 30 years, we'll have conversational AI. 
It's, it's, it's like a fusion power. It's, it's the uh, technology of the future, and it always will be. Um, but uh, with conversational AI, supposing that it were to come into existence in the next 35 years, how would we recognize it, and how, would, how do you think that we should treat it, considering we may have difficulty discerning between an artificial intelligence and a human intelligence? First question, tell me a joke I haven't heard before that works. Now, let's, repeat, let's just repeat the question. The question is about the, the prospects for both recognition of a general uh, uh, conversational artificial intelligence, which I just mean, I believe would mean, you know, that you could have a conversation with, and if it were on a, you know, on a keyboard or something like that, you wouldn't know if you're talking to a human or not, more or less the Turing test. Um, so that's the question. So what would be the, how would we solve that, and how would we, how would we interact with such an intelligence? Is that, is that the question, or is it, is it more recognition? Well, focusing on, on empathy, because uh, we often, if human history is a, is a record of failing to empathize with other people that are not precisely like us. Uh -huh. uh, and as time has gone on, we've been trying to get a better understanding of who we are as human beings, and what makes a human being. Uh, so in a similar sense, when we look at artificial intelligence, if we were to recognize it as Alive or not? Will it have rights? Yes. Exactly. Okay. So will will artificial intelligences eventually be perceived on a common footing with uh, a, a, a natural intelligence, a human intelligence, with empathize, uh, you know, the ability to empathize with it and be more feeling than when my daughter kicked my Roomba? Yeah, well, it may or may not happen. Uh, I mean, either way, it's interesting. I mean, it's a, uh, it's certainly, I, I would regard that as. Quite plausible. It's, it's, uh, that's the way things look, but it's, uh, I don't regard it as threatening. And it, 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 in many ways, it would enhance our lives. In other ways, it would be boring. And it, well, we just have to take the good with the bad. Would you ask an AI for help with your personal problems? I think that's an interesting barrier that would be hard. To Right. Listen to the uh, to the teacher, and, and one of the things that there's just a huge amount of stuff going on is there's uh, my contention. We're here in the fancy building, which is a big part of what we're trying to do. Science fiction. That's like a key theme in both utopian and dystopian futures, because it would make you know, inequality much worse. Or Any thoughts on the years, how you would see the future as it relates to life extension? I, after the moment, thoughts about life extension and uh, one of the dreams that also equally occurs in equal parts dystopian science fiction and in utopian science fiction is this implications of, uh, of life extension perhaps to a uh, permanent lifespan. Uh, after the death of uh, my first wife, I uh, spent a good deal of money, a couple of million, uh, starting companies to build just this. And in fact, we have been just recently doing something that at least stabilizes Alzheimer's patients. Uh, and, and, but the, the key thing is, aging is the failure to repair. And so we understand the underlying repair mechanisms and manipulate them. We can't do a lot, and that's why We've got to do a much better analysis of the genetic basis of our repair systems, which uh, in, in the companies I started is you, arrived at by looking at all the live animals that are artificially produced. That's a different pathway that hasn't been largely used, and I think it has a great prospect for the future, because the other measures, kind of brute force measures, haven't been working all that well. Yes, I always say, uh, Say that one of the worst disasters that could happen to humanity was if the medical people find a cure for death. <laughs> I'm I, I, I horrified with the idea of the population which is getting older and older and leaving no room for the young to, to take over. <coughs> so I, I'm definitely not an enthusiast. Yeah, all of a sudden, after many of the summer dies, the swan, 1930s. 
That's a little surprising well, treatment. That death is something we have to live with. And we can abolish the deep trouble. I think uh, Feynman, though, just to take uh, the opposite side, said something like, most scientists would, would want to live forever if only to see the deep future of what science and technology will provide. Sort of a sense of curiosity that he wanted to live forever <clears throat> to see what kind of scientific creations would come about. Well, you know, the forever part bothers me because if you simply look at the rate accident rate, you find out that if that maintains the same level, it's going to be hard to live more than 1,500 years. So, <laughs> I'm just saying, well, you know what I want people to say about me in 100 years, that I look pretty good for a 150-year-old. Um, so does Lennon. <laughs> he is, is well-preserved. Uh, more questions from the audience on this side of the room, looking around? Yes, okay, you, sir, with your hand. I wonder where you think we'll be in 35 years uh, across the solar system. Uh, and will it be humans out there or more sophisticated AIs? Everyone hear the question? Yeah. Is there a place for humanity in, across the solar system? Yeah, we shall be exploring all kinds of interesting places around the solar system and beyond. And it, it will be done with instruments because no doubt they are much cheaper and more cost effective. But of course, quite apart from that, Humans also want to travel in space, so it's mostly as international sporting events, or, which the public is always willing to pay for. So <laughs> certainly both humans and machines will be doing different jobs. The, the machine's more interested in the, finding out what's going on scientifically, the humans learning to survive. And both of them will certainly need to cooperate. And I look forward to that. It's a great, a great prospect. And I think in 35 years, we should have got a long way before. Much more, we should probably have made much more progress than we did in the last 35 years. Yeah. Of course, it's going to be a while before we, we tune in for the Lunar Super Bowl. <laughs> but I suppose the game. The, the, sure. Yeah, there's so many great things humans can do in not just zero G that modify G, lesser G. For example, there are some reasonable arguments that uh, if you're in the last third of your life, it, you might extend your lifespan just by being in only a fraction of G to and stop imposing such a, a, an impediment on, on your circulatory system. So that means a rotating uh, colony in low Earth orbit, for example. You're, still, you're in space, and, uh, you, and I'm sure there, there are different things. Uh, it's Robert A. Heinlein pointed out in the 1950s that if you fill a big dome and pressurize it beneath the surface of the moon, people with wings on their arms can fly. It's a 0.18 G. So there are all kinds of fun things you can do, uh, but the, the you know, mining of asteroids, I think that's inevitable in this century. For certain metals, particularly, which we're running out of. Uh, so, but the machines, here's the good news, are going to do with their AI tenders, a lot of the hard grunt work for us while well, we get to play and fly. Um, speaking about uh, life in space, um, so I want to talk, I'll take another question in a second, uh, about aliens. It's always a, a hot topic, uh, it is the subject of aliens. Um, Freeman and I have talked briefly about you know, the, the so-called Drake equation. Um, uh, and I'm wondering, first, Greg, what, what are your impressions about the prospects for extraterrestrial life in general, but then specifically of a technological format that we could plausibly engage in communication with? Well, life generally is, I would expect, quite widespread, and then my old friend uh, David Brin points out that life in uh, ice caps and moons, such as around Jupiter and Saturn, is maybe, maybe very common, but the trick is that it doesn't have great prospects for us sending us uh, radio waves. <laughs> The, uh, but generally, for advanced intelligence, uh, we should realize that uh, star formation began many billions of years ago, earlier than here, because we live out in the boonies. The center of the galaxy has had time to develop civilizations much longer than we have, almost 10 billion years longer. We're only like 4.6 billion years 
on the blog. So looking inward toward the galaxy is the place to look for artificial signals, I think. And when my brother and I have written some papers about this strategy, you should look for flashing lighthouses, not steady communication. Or beacons. So I think we've only begun in the, the, the big initiatives under the breakthrough program uh, to really look at the huge spectrum of artificial transmissions that might be flinging around the galaxy all the time. So we've just scratched the surface. In fact, the amount of, of data processed by the breakthrough initiative in the last, what is it, Jim, three, four years is larger than the total amount of SETI observations done. Well, if you want to just uh, for the audience benefit, uh, I know your brother works on it, but he doesn't have a microphone, so oh. you have a chance to explain what the Breakthrough Initiative oh, is. Oh, the Breakthrough Initiative is uh, uh, funded by Yuri Milner, uh, a Russian billionaire living in uh, Mountain Dew, who uh, has started several programs to push forward things he thinks are a good idea but underfunded, such as the search for intelligent transmissions and also the development of really advanced spacecraft, even starships, small little things about the size of this, powered by a beam to go to other stars to really break through the whole speed principle. I think the main major impact of that, that second program is going to be to, to develop great, efficient means of sending things around the solar system better than rockets. But the point is, it, uh, it, it is an adventure scheme, and each one of these is getting, what is it, 10 million a year just to do the research. So each, each program. So, uh, Freeman, would you like to say anything about uh, intelligent aliens and so forth uh, throughout the galaxy? Yes, I think this is a real problem, but we haven't seen anything yet. It's, uh, there have been very extensive listening programs, and uh, in Princeton we had an optical city program done by our students looking for these flashes in the sky, which is a very cost-effective and easy way to look for aliens. We never found any. It's also a big disappointment. I, I, I'm still surprised every time when we look for things and we never find them. So, so, so the aliens, for one reason or another, are very well hidden. Maybe there just aren't any aliens, and that's, of course, a sad possibility. It might happen that actually the origin of life is a very, very unlikely event. We don't know. We simply don't understand the origin of life. It's one of the big scientific problems which we've made very little progress thinking about. But it, is, it remains as one of the big challenges. Anyhow, so I say three cheers for Yuri Milner. He's doing a great job. I, I support him, and I, I hope very much he finds something. But so far, we have always been disappointed. You, you know, the question of life, what bothers me about our current program is, it seems to me the most obvious place to look for life is beneath the surface of Mars. Because we know it had a wet, warm environment very early, much earlier than we had. And as the atmosphere of the seas went away, it would have gone underground because we know we've got an enormous microbial life sphere below our planet. And it's been there for several billion years. And it's afraid of oxygen. But we haven't explored beneath the surface of Mars. The easiest thing to do is send rovers into the over 200 caves we have already found. And that's a lot more plausible outcome than talking about drilling through 10 kilometers of ice on Europa, which ain't going to get done in this half of this century, for sure, before 2054. Uh, <laughs> question about the team. Can you, uh, so the question is to Professor Dyson, uh, whether or not he can describe Dyson spheres and if he saw the episode of Star Trek that involves <laughs> such Dyson spheres. I did see the Star Trek episode and it was a good story and it was fine. It had nothing much to do with, with my ideas, but it was, it was fun. <laughs> 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 the, the, the idea of a Dyson sphere is, is actually a misunderstanding. 
I was interested in searching for aliens who don't want to communicate, who happen to be, for one reason or another, silent. But one way to detect them is looking for infrared radiation. It doesn't involve building a big sphere. It could be in any kind of a habitat. The, the, the point is the aliens would have to have some way of radiating away waste heat, and they would have to have a large exposed surface of the, wherever they were living radiating away waste heat in order to survive. And we could observe the radiation of infrared. So I proposed that as a scientific project. And about 20 years later, it actually was done. The IRS satellite, International Radio Astronomy Satellite, no, internet, <laughs> infrared satellite, was flown. It was a, a little satellite, a little telescope over the Atlantic, which observed the sky over several years and found about a million of these objects which had all the appearance of an alien super civilization. But of course, that's not what they are. <laughs> we know that these objects, in fact, are just young stars which happen to be still surrounded by dust clouds that took the dancing out of the dust, which, which is part of the normal process of formation of stars. So young bright stars have this appearance they radiate copiously in the infrared and not so much in the visible. And that's what these things are. So as a search for aliens, this was a dismal failure. <laughs> Another fun, fun fact related to my group. Uh, um, when I had uh, the honor of having Freeman and his wife over for dinner not too long ago, we had um, my, my, uh, my wife was you know, showing off different household appliances that I I'm known to use on occasion. One of them was the Dyson Sphere Ball vacuum, which then my daughter also kicked. I don't know what she has against that. Um, uh, there was another question close by. Let's see. Still wanting to see other people asking questions. Okay, right here. Uh, were there not intelligent aliens out there, familiar with our horrible human history, not they not want to avoid contact? <laughs> would, would intelligent aliens want to avoid humanity because of our uh, treacherous, barbarous nature, uh, I should say. Well, we can only hope they haven't been able to see our television show. <laughs> Come to a universal agreement to avoid us. We should, we should certainly expect some accidental contacts. <laughs>